way that I'm thinking about this problem. And then I'd love to turn it into a discussion. And if you have clarifying questions or stuff as I go along, feel free to interrupt. Um, all right. So I guess broadly, my research kind of falls within this space where I kind of work between models and observations and really to bridge both of these areas across different scales to both unlock like missing information about the ice sheet subsurface and all of this, you know, to work towards improving predictions of ice sheet evolution um, in a warming climate. And for today, we're going to focus on, you know, kind of this geophysical observation space using radar data and, and my recent paper that looks at how we can use radar data to map the basal thermal state, but I will briefly touch on some of my ice sheet modeling work that is tied to these results. Um, and I want to start with, you know, just creating a very simple mental model for how ice flows and how this is tied to the ice thermal state. So, you know, there's really two components of ice flow. One is sliding, um, and one is deformation and uh, sliding is what allows these really you know, fast flow of glaciers near the ice sheet margin. But both sliding and deformation are related to the ice thermal state because um, warmer ice is more deformable and a thawed bed means that there can be water at the base which can provide lubrication and facilitate faster sliding. And so what this really means is that the ice thermal state fundamentally controls how ice flows. And this is important since ice flowing and calving off into the ocean is the predominant mechanism of mass loss from Antarctica and contributes you know, to global sea level rise. Um, so given this then, it seems like it would be really important to know the thermal state to make good predictions of mass loss. So then this brings us to, well, how can you determine the thermal state of an ice sheet? And one way is we can drill through the ice sheet and collect temperature profiles. Um, and here's three examples of places we could collect profiles. And now in glacially, all of these, you know, the temperature profile increases with depth, but the basal temperature uh, is different in each of these cases. So in the left profile, the temperature is at the pressure melting point. So that's you know the warmest temperature possible before it turns to liquid water. And in the middle profile, the basal temperature is well below this, meaning that it is very frozen. And the example on the right is near thawed, just below the melting point, right? Now, this is great, but here is the coverage that we have from borehole uh, data across Antarctica, and you can see that it's extremely sparse, right? And that's because it's difficult to get drill equipment to these really remote locations, and it's expensive, and you know there's very short weather windows to work around. So on the other hand, there's radar sounding. And this is really the, the advantage here is it provides much better spatial coverage, as you can see in this map on the left, showing all the radar sounding data that we have across Antarctica. And from each of these uh, lines, we have a radargram, which shows us the you know, slice through the ice sheet, and you can see the internal structure as the electromagnetic wave you know, is able to penetrate through the ice sheet layers and reflect off the bedrock. Now, you know, this is great. We can do, we can do airborne data to get um, a radargram. We can also do ground-based surveys. Uh, and both of these contain information about the ice thermal state which is expressed through the variations in the signal power. So that you can see on the bottom two plots where you can see you know, how the electromagnetic wave is sensitive to the temperature of the ice, how much it attenuates, and the ice bed interface, how bright that reflection is. But you can see because it's variations in power that you know, it is a measurement of the ice temperature, but it's an indirect measurement. So finally, there's another way we can determine the ice thermal state, and that's using a numerical bottle. And so for this, let's say we have you know, a model that considers the ice sheet geometry, takes in the physics of ice flow, some boundary conditions, and then we can use that model to predict the ice thermal state, which can get something like this. And in a lot of ways, you know, this map is fantastic because it's a 3D model showing a continuous field for you know all of the Antarctic ice sheet. And here 
you know, you're looking at just the bottom layer of the ice bed interface. And you can use this model then to examine questions like how the ice sheet will, you know, flow and evolve in the future. Okay, so here's the catch though. Here are other models from the same intercomparison project. And it's pretty clear from this comparison that the ice thermal states are not the same, right? So if you're trying to understand the thermal state, it's, you know, it's hard to know, well, then which one do you believe? So I think the, the takeaway from this is that, you know, when it comes to the ice thermal state, it's tricky because there's no perfect solution to determine it. Borehole data is very accurate, but super sparse. Radar is, you know, a denser measurement, but an indirect measure uh, of temperature. Um, and models are continuous, but they don't agree. So then I think we can ask, well, who cares? Does it matter to precisely know the thermal state? And the focus of uh, this presentation and what I think is the real takeaway here is that the answer is yes, because accounting for basal thawing and its influence on ice flow changes mass loss projections. So on the top left, you know, is this map of current mass loss for Antarctica. And you can see that the vast majority of mass loss is from West Antarctica. And as a result, also West Antarctica is the focus of a lot of research. But um, East Antarctica is currently not losing very much mass, but my research has shown that East Antarctica has a lot of near thawed regions. So regions where the temperature is frozen, but very close to thawing. And that if the some of these regions could thaw, then parts of East Antarctica could become a source of future mass loss. Um, which is interesting because I think this sort of mechanism has been largely overlooked. So I want to start with uh, a bit of the um, numerical model experiment side. And here you're looking at um, both a cross section and a map view. And I want to start by just exploring what do I mean by uh, thawable or close to thawing. So you can see in these you know, two illustrations um, that frozen bed and thawed bed is in close proximity. So the bed is thawed beneath the fast filling parts of the glacier, but then just upstream or between the glaciers, the bed is frozen. And so just spatially, what this brings about is the question then, well, what if parts of the bed are thawable. So patches that are currently frozen, but near thawed transitioning to actually being thawed. Now, what I did is I set up experiments in ISSM where I initialized and ran a thermomechanical model where just along the coastline in these regions that you can see on the right uh, that are labeled near thawed, I actually prescribed thawing. And when I did this, then I ran the model forward in time for 100 years to see how this affected mass loss by prescribing thawing at the base of the ice sheet. And these are the results that I got from those experiments, where you can see that mass loss increases as a result of basal thawing. And here, each bar chart shows a drainage basin of Antarctica, and each bar is one of the four experiments. Uh, that I ran here showing where each experiment basically has a, a larger amount of thawing. And so what you can see then is the rate of mass loss over 100 years increases as you basically prescribe more thawing in each region. Now, I think what's really interesting though from these results is that uh, the regions with the most amount of mass loss are actually in East Antarctica. And if I go back to this comparison to current mass loss on the left, uh, what you can see is that, you know, currently highest rates of mass loss are in West Antarctica, but uh, East Antarctica is roughly in mass balance right now. But um, my results show that East Antarctica could be particularly sensitive to mass loss if some parts of the bed that are near thawed transition to actually being thawed. So the takeaway from this is, you know, well, so then why is East Antarctica so vulnerable to thawing? And this is largely because East Antarctica has more near thawed bed 
as you can see also from this figure here, uh, the two regions with the most near thawed uh, area. So regions, so basically basal temperatures within a few degrees of the melting point are also the regions that have the highest rates of mass loss due to thawing. Um, but I think what's really interesting what comes out of uh, this analysis is that parts of East Antarctica could be really interesting, which brings us to really the focus of what I wanna talk about now. So if we transition to the second part, you know, this, these model results motivate that it could be important for understanding mass loss, but then what comes up with this question is great. That's a, that's a model analysis, but can we back this up with observations? What do observations show in this region? And for that, I will turn to radar data that we have in this area. And um, yeah, so now we'll talk about how we can use that radar data uh, to leverage it for thermal state characterization. So let's start by revisiting this map of where we have radar data and then remembering that all of this radar data is collected from different systems in different countries. So the problem gets a little bit more complicated, um, but in the bottom uh, in the circle, I've um, the, that region has radar data from US, British and Italian surveys. So I was able to access all of that data, which is the good news. And before we dive into how I uh, analyze this radar data, I also want to point out that this region of East Antarctica is actually really inter interesting from a dynamic perspective as well. So here you're looking at the bed topography um, and this coastline area, which is the George Five Land region, is connected to the Wilkes of Glacial Basin which just for comparison uh, is about the same size as the state of California and is the equivalent of three to four meters of sea level rise. So this is a large area. And if we zoom into just the coastline in this region, here you can see a map of surface velocities. And in particular, notice that both Cook and Ninnis glaciers are the two regions that ice from Wilkes Basin has to flow through to get to the grounding zone. And you'll also notice uh, in these regions that the grounding line is actually below sea level and that there's a retrograde bed slope just inland from this area. Now, the other thing to notice in this region is these dashed regions, which are labeled ice plugs. And this comes out of a study from about a decade ago, which shows that these, these, in particular, these ice plug areas could be really important for the dynamics of the entire Wilkes subglacial basin. And that if the grounding line were to retreat inland of the ice plugs, then the entire Wilkes basin could be basically um, unstable and prone to um, retreat. Um, resulting in, you know, on the order of three meters of sea level rise over time, eventually uh, due to that retreat. Now in the same region as these ice plugs, there's also been past grounding line retreat. So this shows a, a reconstruction of the grounding line from about 330,000 years ago. And you can see that it's up to about 200 kilometers inland of its current location um, in kind of the same zone around where these ice plugs are. So then the question then is in combination with my um, modeling analysis, which you know maps out the basal thermal state in this region, could there be large extents of near thought area? And um, do observations back up this kind of result that there could be near thought area and basically can we get an observational ground truth uh, in this region where there's very, very sparse data. So here are the airborne radar sounding data that I have in this area. Um, you can see it comes from three different um, uh, radar systems. And um, the main, the thing that we're really after here is, you know, extracting information about the thermal state uh, and how radar can encode this information. So here's an example of a radar gram segment again. And 
now I've highlighted around the bed echo power here, which you can just visually pick out, pick out as the peak power. And this received power um, is a function of the depth average attenuation and the bed reflectivity. So how much the signal attenuates through the ice and how much is reflected off the bed. Now, attenuation and reflectivity are both sensitive to the thermal state because warmer ice causes more attenuation and water at the bed causes a brighter reflection. So to formalize this, um, what this means is our measured uh, received power is a function of several components, which include the bed reflectivity and the depth average attenuation. So the components in gray, uh, we're going to ignore because we can either correct for them or neglect them entirely for these purposes. Um, so really what we're left with is the received power is proportional to the bed reflectivity and the depth average attenuation. And now in terms of bed reflectivity and attenuation, um, this is great then because both of these components are related to variability in the thermal state. So to show you what I mean by this, um, here in the bottom left, you're looking at bed reflectivity. Uh, and this is really a measure of the dielectric contrast of an interface. So here you can see that there is a greater contrast between ice and water than ice and rock. So the radar reflection from the wet interface has a greater return power, uh, which shows up at then as a brighter reflection in the radar gram. Um, moving to attenuation. Um, Attenuation rate is really the amount of dielectric absorption of the radar wave through the ice. So you can see here that this is highly temperature dependent. Um, and in particular, you can see that the highest attenuation rates are through the warmest ice. And remember, the warmest ice is just above the bed. So that also means that that is where uh, there is the highest attenuation rates. So then the next step that I do is actually derive the bed uh, reflectivity and the depth average attenuation rates from all the radar data in this area. Um, and I'll skip the details of these methods, but these are methods that have been developed by my lab. So once I do that, here is what I get. And in a lot of ways, just these attenuation rate and reflectivity uh, maps are already great because they can start to tell you um, some information about the thermal state because of what attenuation and relative reflectivity encode. So what I mean by that is um, we can kind of start to make some qualitative interpretations where, for example, you can see in the regions that I've circled here, um, both attenuation rate and relative bed reflectivity are low. And because they're both low, we can interpret that the bed must be frozen in these areas. And here are some examples where both the attenuation rate and relative bed reflectivity are high, where we can interpret that the bed must be thawed. And you'll also see, though, that there are some regions where the um, attenuation rate and bed reflectivity are more ambiguous, and it's harder than to make an interpretation about the thermal state. So. Because of that, I will show you how we can extract actually more from this data using statistical analysis. So statistically, we can think of this as a binary classification problem, and we can use a logistic regression model to get classifications of the thermal state. So the task is to assign a probability between 0 for frozen and 1 for thawed. And then we also have things that contain information about the thermal state. Uh, that we can use as predictors. So we have some regions where we are confident that the bed is frozen or thawed, um, uh, or sorry. So we, so I guess like what I'm trying to say is the attenuation and reflectivity and ice thickness vary uh, in connection with the thermal state. So we can use those as predictors. Um, and then for training regions, we we can define these because we have. Um, some regions that we're confident that the bed is frozen or thawed um, that we can use as labeled training data. So I identify those regions using surface velocity thresholds to find the fastest and slowest flowing regions. Um, 
in this uh, study area. Uh, for And then those regions, as you can see in the map here, I use uh, uh, thawed and frozen bed training area. And then the rest in gray is the unknown region where uh, the logistic regression model then can provide predictions. So using the logistic regression model, um, here are the predictions along the radar survey lines. And again, notice zero is predicted frozen to one is predicted thawed. Um, and these results are pretty good, but to get a continuous product for this region, I interpolate between the radar lines, um, like you can see here. And then what I do is I pick thresholds. So in order to bin the predictions into thermal state classifications, frozen or thawed, what I do is I pick thresholds uh, to say, okay, this is this is close enough to zero, close enough to one, that we're going to assign this as frozen or thawed. All right, so this is walking you through one realization, but I actually run eight total realizations uh, to make this method more robust and also to account for uncertainty. So each logistic regression model has slightly different thresholds for processing the radar data that's used as predictors, for picking surface velocity, thresholds for labeled training regions, and um, thresholding the predictions into thermal state classification. So each logistic regression model then produces a map of the classified thermal state. And then what I do is I stack all of the realizations uh, together to get not only classifications, but also a measure of confidence. So once I do that, then here is what I get. Um, And in a lot of ways, this is this is useful. I mean, it's it's a um, model derived map of the thermal state that's purely from the radar observations, right? And I interpolated it to make it continuous, so it's at a resolution then that we can compare to the output of ice sheet models. But um, I want to walk through kind of what some of these regions mean. So, you know, there are regions where you can see the realizations agree, showing high confidence, either thawed or frozen bed classifications. And then there's also regions that are unclassified, either because there's no data there or because the realizations don't agree at all on those regions. But a lot of this is actually falls into uh, the more intermediate area. And while you know a lot of this you could interpret as, well, then this is less confident, um, I actually think these uh, regions that are not high confidence, frozen or thawed, are really interesting because of what this could imply. And I think what this could imply is near thawed. Um, based off of these realizations being less clear to being able to apply frozen or thawed, what falls out of this then is near thawed conditions. And you'll also notice that this includes a lot of the ice plug regions, which is um, in the dashed outline. Okay, so really our goal though is to get observations to compare to the modeled thermal state and while you can't directly compare the exact temperature measurements um, between the model and radar maps, you can compare where the bed is at near or below the melting point. So, you know, just looking at it, it might look kind of different, but here in the green circles are places where some or all of the models match the radar derived map pretty well. And over in the black circles are some examples though, where they don't match, I, the models don't match very well and they don't match the data very well. Um, I think really you could spend all day doing this type of compa comparison, um, but I think the point here is that models need observational inputs to have accurate temperature fields. And I think that this radar analysis approach provides a new way of actually getting an independent observationally derived estimate, which is better than any observational input that goes into a model right now, which could then enable comparison to you know, more model derived estimates and also could have even be integrated into models themselves. 
So kind of talking then a little bit more about what this means and what the implications could mean from this sort of analysis. You know, we've touched on modeling the thermal state, and then I went through my method to constrain the thermal state uh, with radar observations. And then, you know, I just said, oh, it would be great uh, to then actually integrate these observations into a model. Well, what I think also that all of this gets to is we also need to get a better understanding of the controls on the ice thermal state um, and what really is influencing such different predictions in what the thermal state of Antarctica is. And in terms of influences, I think we can kind of break this down into three categories of boundary conditions, thermomechanical effects, and model initialization and approximation methods. So in terms of boundary conditions, this is things like, you know, what the accumulation rate is, what the surface temperature is, what the geothermal heat flux is. Just as an example, in the region, uh, in the George Five land region that I've been looking at quite a bit, um, here are maps of geothermal heat flux. And you can see that there's a huge range in values. And depending on which map gets used in um, the numerical model, then this can affect the, the thermal model results. Um, another component, though, is um, the thermomechanical effects. So this has to do, you know, you have warmer temperatures at the base of the ice sheet and then colder above. So there's, this is uh, what matters then is how you're modeling and resolving conduction, but also horizontal advection as um, both of those can change, you know, what your ice thermal state is. And then another piece that I think is important is the model initialization and approximation also influence what your ice thermal state is. So for example, ISSM, uh, the model that I used for my um, thermal state experiments uh, is inverts for present day conditions, but other ice sheet models use a paleo spin up and depending on which one you use will also affect uh, your thermal state as well as the thermal steady state approximation, which is a very common thing to assume no uh, change in the thermal state over time for ice sheet models. But as my results are pointing to that, maybe this is not always a good assumption to be making um, because it makes it hard then to capture uh, changes in the thermal state. And, and then we're just missing that piece. So, I think that altogether, this kind of thinking about it at a system scale, kind of understanding of what processes can influence it, and also using geophysical observations um, to better map um, the basal conditions, as I showed, but also I think the end glacial thermal state can be done similarly, are all ways that we can work towards then improving um, and uh, I guess, improving large scale ice sheet models and resolving these discrepancies in the ice thermal state between models. And altogether, I think that this can also improve projections of ice flow and mass loss, which have a lot of uncertainty right now um, due to all of these differences between models. So with that, I am happy to take questions or turn this into a discussion. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much, um, Eliza. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, and I'm very happy that it worked out in the end. Um, does someone have any questions? <clears throat> uh, please just unmute and uh, go ahead. Uh, maybe I'll start. Um, so I think it's uh, a very nice result that you got. And do you think it can be somehow useful to um, include in new heat flow estimations? Or um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I guess a piece that I've been thinking about a little bit that I, um, I think 
it, it would be interesting to see if there'd be a way to use uh, radar observations directly to constrain like heat flow estimates, I guess is the piece that I'm, I'm curious about. So trying to, you know, separate that piece almost similarly to how people have at uh, borehole sites. Um, if you can, you know, if you can start to extract this kind of information, I think you could potentially get at that sort of estimate. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think I think it's really valuable, and I think we should really think of using it as a constraint um, because yeah, there is not much direct data, and radar I think has not been used much so far. Um, yeah, so I think so, and I think it's it's hard. Like I I think it's hard to process it at the scale without. Um, some some existing knowledge so i think like if you have a borehole estimate in one place or somewhere as like ground truthing then you can do like statistical analysis um to basically map a broader area i think could be a direction um that could be uh promising for that type of analysis and would would at least be really interesting to compare to you know geothermal heat flux maps that we have right now and our kind of our understanding of um heat flow and to at least like just start to like look in that space which I don't think has been done that much which would be very interesting yeah definitely um hi Lisa my yeah uh, hi question uh thank you for the talk it was really really interesting uh, amazing I really enjoy it so um we actually a few things that you touched now uh, when you were replying to Marine so first, if you were uh, thinking about uh, using this technique to different areas, like, well, of course, the areas that you have access to the data from the um, uh, radar. And then second, um, if you, because you said I like, use eight realizations to have that um, kind of a statistical uh, estimations of the, um, the um, yeah, the area, right? Were you, like, the, have you thought about having, like, a more, like, probabilistic inversion when you have like three parameters like thaw, not thaw, and like frozen per pixel, for example, or something to, that you can apply to like a larger area and do the probabilistic inversion, do the work of the realizations and have the, like have, in a sense, having millions of realizations, right? So yeah, just your thoughts yeah. on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. It's something that I think could be a better way for scaling it essentially because yeah as you're pointing to kind of like i guess in some ways this is getting towards the limits of this specific analysis like if we go back for example to um the results here it's like um you know you can you can do some comparison but it would be really valuable to almost sample the whole space not just frozen or thawed the the that would require like, I guess, some sort of like training on maybe the more intermediate temperature categories or some understanding of that. So that then probabilistically, it could be something that you include, I guess, in the space mm -hmm. and and have your realizations train on, which I guess is is a harder piece because we don't have very many measurements of places that are like it's it's common to have data in places where it's very cold, mostly because uh, you you know you can drill to the base there like you know ice rises and things like that um, it, and ice divides um, and then in in really fast flowing parts of the glacier you can pretty confidently say that the bed is thawed but I think the more challenging place is how to get I guess kind of like a training region or an understanding of these near thought areas and what they what that pattern looks like so that then you could you know sample really the whole space at a, with many more realizations. But I think that, that that kind of more like probabilistic approach has a lot of advantages for scaling and also for then being able to talk about your results, you know, in terms of uh, likelihood and stuff that right now is harder to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why I was thinking about the area itself and then about the confidence itself that you're having there because you said that you have eight realizations, right? And yeah, I, I see, I see where well, I'm a probabilistic 
mind. So it's for me, it's like, oh, you can do this, like you have millions of realization, probably in the same amount of time that you have those eight, right? Not in the same amount of time, but the computation is done by itself once you have the the framework, right? And then you can expand yeah. this to any areas. It just, um, and you just could do values per pixel, right? Pixels when you have the data. Yeah, it's a hard work, I think but I think that's... I think it's a good idea. I think it's the direction that this should move into. It just requires like, I think just testing a bit more how it's, I guess, how how you're starting to train with and and like basically inter carefully being able to interpret some regions so that then you can kind of uh, do that uh, um, larger mm -hmm. thing or or potentially just running a lot of realizations and then sampling. Like it's possible that kind of these categories of like frozen near thought and thought could just fall out of it. I don't know. If you have thoughts yeah, on yeah, that, you can. Yeah, I you can it, just select like a yeah. bi not binary, but like just um, for example, for each let's say pixel, you have five categories, right? Uh, to different like from zero, like frozen to holy thought, so that you divide yeah, in categories. Yeah, but yeah, well, yeah, yeah there's a lot of ways to do it, but yeah. So, but yeah, that's great. And I think like it's so much potential from this, you know, because you have the data uh, in a lot of regions. Um, yeah, well, exactly. Not that you actually have it, but you could potentially uh, get the data in all these different regions. And it's not easy, easily, but I see like it's kind of easily scalable, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> done already, you know. So, yeah. yeah, but that's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Thanks. Thanks, Eliza. That was a really excellent talk. I really appreciated you um, stepping through all the background too, especially for a non-specialist. Thank you. So I have a naive question from that non-specialist perspective just looking at this figure now um you have quite a lot of um sort of thought or higher basal temperatures in the terra daily land area of the coast there so to the uh west of the Burt's glacier i'm yeah, just wondering yeah, yeah. if you have any ideas or thoughts on the reasons why that particular area is warmer like it doesn't look particularly Bar surface velocity, I'm not sure. I guess it depends on which heat flow model you use, but just wondering about your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a no, you bring up a good point. I've been interested in that region as well. Also, just because if you look across these different ice sheet models, it's extremely different in that area. And there's not as many fast flowing glaciers. There's one sort of small glacier there, and then I think Dibble is up here. So there's a bit of, um, you know, there's there's some small glaciers in that area, but nothing like uh, George Five Land and connecting to Wilkes Basin. Um, I I don't have a great answer for why. I'm starting to try to look into it a bit more and and try to understand a bit more uh, what might be basically causing it to be so near thawed and and in some models thawed. Um, but immediately, I don't know yet. Um, it's possible, like if we go, I don't know if the one geothermal heat flux map that I showed, like if you look here, it doesn't really show that whole region, but there are some models that have it kind of warm in that direction. Um, but I don't know that it's driven by that as much as um, I guess like the other piece that I, I have to wonder about with comparing different ice sheet models is, um, you know, you're, you're basically, you're matching, um, observed surface velocities to your model and then inverting for subsurface conditions. That's how ISSM works. It's not true for all the other ice sheet models, but at least for ISSM, it works like that, which means that in places where it's slower flowing, um, a smaller difference. Uh, between your model and observed velocities could potentially um, like 
be acceptable in your conditions. Like sometimes that can almost weight it towards being more accurate in like these really fast flowing areas. Um, but again, there, there's a huge variation between ISU models. So it also could be like boundary conditions that are influencing um, these differences. I'm not entirely sure. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe on that. Uh, so when you have the thought or not thought map, how would you include it in a ice sheet model? Is it then calculated to temperature or? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of ways you could potentially try to include it. One would be to just basically like in your, like have it as part of your basal boundary condition. So this would basically be like a melt or no melt parameterization, which wouldn't be, it wouldn't resolve the whole like frozen to near thawed to thawed as much as just is there melt or can you not allow melt in your model? Um, so that's one possibility. The other area though that I'm starting to think a lot more about and I think is a pretty promising direction is just trying to use attenuation because as we, uh, as I talked about, uh, let me go back to that slide um, here, attenuation and temperature are uh, related. And so if you know attenuation, you could back out, or sorry, if you, if you know temperature in your ISU model, right, you could back out attenuation rates and then get a depth average value from that, which you could directly compare then to a depth average value from your radar observation. So there could also be a way to integrate um, radar through um, attenuation matching basically between depth average values. It would be better though to have attenuation, like the, the step there, which would be really useful is to be able to get uh, the radar analysis to the level that you're not just having a depth average value, you're having a couple of layers of attenuation rates segmented throughout the, uh, with depth. And then you could really start to get a internal constraint on temperature as well uh, and be able to resolve like, I, I think the biggest challenge right now in ice shoot models is, you know, there's no observations that are really directly constraining that um, couple of layers, you know, in the ice sheet just above the bed, which is where the ice temperature is the highest and what really matters then for understanding the ice bed interface. Yeah, I have another question just for you uh, on this exactly. I know you said that uh, all the details of the models to separate the uh, better effectivity and attenuation uh, are on those papers, but just for me, I don't, I don't know much about this because I, I will imagine that if you have a, like attenuation and then increase reflectivity from uh, water on the, on the bed, right? Then all those, the signal kind of, um, cancels each other, right? You have attenuation, but also more reflectivity. So in a few words, how does the method work to separate those? Because I guess it's yeah. like ambig could be a little bit ambiguity also in that separation. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. So this is a simplified version. Let me, let me, I have an extra slide that can help explain this a bit. So basically this is a simplified version. Imagine you're on one line in the in the 1D case on the top, okay? And then and the bottom is, here's this circle, um, right? And you're all, pretend you can only see, so you're, you're at the center point and you can only see within this 50 kilometer radius. Now, if you plot here, bed echo power versus ice thickness, just in this circle, you get sort of this linear relationship with, between the two. Mm -hmm. What this allows you to do is decorrelate the two. So you basically are decorrelating variations in uh, uh, in return power with ice thickness. You're removing the the ice thickness variation signal. What you're left with then is the attenuation rate. Mm -hmm. And so then you have attenuation rate from this process. You have your received power 
And then in that radar equation, which I showed before, the other ones we can either neglect, correct for, or ignore. And so then you have your received power minus attenuation gives you the bed power. So that's how I kind of tease apart those two signals. Yeah, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, great.